Thanks very much, Sean, and everybody at Google Earth Outreach for inviting me. Um, so I want to talk about critters, which I think is part of the thing that we overlook when we're thinking about maps. Does anybody know what this butterfly is? Yeah. Ah, Kirk. <laughs> TNC guy, I always, you know, you shouldn't invite him. Um, yeah, and so that's a question we'll get to in a second, but this is a butterfly that I think is a great example for why what we're trying to do I think is, is very important. This is the bay checker spot butterfly used to occur right here. It, um, it was found throughout the peninsula up into the East Bay right in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco where the California Academy of Sciences is. And it's been going extinct like crazy. Every year we're seeing a population of these butterflies go extinct. And they're now just hanging on just south of us in San Jose. This isn't just the bay checker spot butterfly. We're seeing thousands of, hundreds of thousands of species, the same pattern. Species are going extinct a thousand times faster than they ever have before. And this is largely happening under the radar. It, um, it's kind of like Rebecca was talking earlier. It's, we assume we know this stuff. We don't. We don't have a clue where these species are, where they're going extinct, and what's happening to them. And the problem is almost worse than that. Not only do we not have the data, nobody cares. There's so much nature apathy out there that we could have done something to prevent this butterfly going extinct if we had had the the grassroots support to do something about it. It was again, like Rebecca was saying, showing people the, um, the logging threat in their backyards. P if people know they can do something proactive, they might. So those are our two questions, is how do we get the kind of data that we need and how do we get people engaged and excited? That's the problem we're trying to solve with iNaturalist. Um, when Rebecca was talking about all the stuff with uh, uh, Google Earth, I mean, that was, for me, that's what really got me interested in this with iNaturalist. It was the first time I saw Google Earth, that you could zoom in and see your house. And then you could zoom back out and see the planet. And just that connection of scales is so exciting. But again, we're not getting the butterflies. We're not getting the lizards. We're not getting the little critters that, are, that we care so much about in this landscape. <clears throat> and if we're not going to do it with satellites, what's the tool we're going to use? Well, with iNaturalist, we're just using people outside with their mobile phones. We're trying to grow a big um, global community of naturalists who are working together, teaching each other about nature, and scaling this problem so that we can have biodiversity as a player that can come to the table with the land cover community, the carbon community, the water community. So just to quickly show you how this works, this was a conference that was here in San Jose a couple months ago, and everybody was in that building in the convention center. And we said, hey, come out to this little park. This is called Discovery Meadows, some of you might know. It's sandwiched between two freeways. It's got a little creek running through it. And we said, we're all going to whip out iNaturalist and take as many observations as we can. So in three hours, we had 51 people walked over there, and they took 817 observations, which turned out to be 148 species in that little postage stamp. But what's cool is, well, anybody can observe. iNaturalist is really a, it's a social network. It's a community of people. So this snail, for example, this guy, Colin, on the top, he took a picture. He said, I have no idea what this is. It's a snail. He, he documented the snail. That woman is an is a invertebrate zoologist named Suzanne Hewitt, who lives in the UK. And she said, oh, I know this snail. It's a European snail. And she gave a name to it. So Colin observed it. Suzanne identified it. But then the conservation community said, whoa, 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 small pointed snail. This is on our watch list. This is a European snail. This is what it did to Australia. It's one of the worst agricultural pests. And this was the second record from Santa Clara County in this tiny postage stamp meadow. So that connection of people exploring their backyards, connecting with experts, naturalists, scientists who can actually tell them what these things are, and then connecting with the conservation community say, hey, we can do something about this, this, this um, information. So this is the map I wanted to present. This is all of iNaturalist observations. Um, there's 1.9 million so far. We'll hit 2 million by the end of the year. Um, so if you zoom into the Bay Area, for example, you get like these, each of these is a little observation. So I think I can go. Yeah, so here we are. We're right here. Um, down at Google, and this is, if you look right out, there's this incredible baylands right here. Yeah, yeah. So you can see a lot of bird watchers and people like to go around and, and see things. So I can click on, a, I can click on these, and each one of these is a, should be clickable. Um, there's a little Bewix wren. Let's see what else I got here, whoops. Um, yeah, so there's a Russian thistle. And what's cool is, again, every map on the site is a Google map, and you can, it's all connected, you can zoom out, and really see that kind of same Google Earth thing where you can see how the entire world is, is made up of these little observations. Um, so again, we've, Google's been incredibly helpful to us, Google Earth Outreach. Our first collaboration was a, was a collaboration with Save the Redwoods League and, um, uh, and Google working on this kind of thing for Redwoods. Our first Android app was, was supported by Google Earth Outreach. So it's just been really cool to have this kind of collaboration. Um, getting back here. Turn to full screen. 
Um, so what I wanted to quickly say um, is what's really neat about this data is once this data gets verified by scientists, it becomes what we call research quality data, meaning that this data goes into the uh, scientific databases that scientists use to um, do, do research on these kind of critters and conservation. I'm sure many of you have seen this butterfly. It's called the common buckeye. It's a very common bu butterfly here. This is everything we know about this butterfly from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. But what's really, really cool about this is 60% of the stuff is from iNaturalist. So we're getting 66% of all, everything we know about that butterfly from iNaturalist. But what's cooler than that is within the last 10 years, it's over 80%. So for literally thousands of species, the real time, kind of like Rebecca was saying, the real time information, not the historical museum stuff, which is historically what scientists have had access to, the real time information is increasingly coming from iNaturalist. Um, I just want to point out some of the partners we're working with. Uh, uh, National Geographic, we have this collaboration called the Great Nature Project, which has been a lot of fun. We have a network now of seven countries that have their own instances of iNaturalist. This is the one in Mexico, and they're giving, they got Carlos Slim to give these prizes. Um, the National Park Service, we've been working a ton with, who've been doing um, bio blitzes, the National Park Centennials this year. There'll be 500 simultaneous iNaturalist bio blitzes across the Park Service in May this year. And this is a group in, uh, in uh, Madagascar um, working with Cuba Botanical Gardens to do. Um, here, get this map up, to do a um, monitoring of plants in small reserves. And this is just, this is one of the reserves that they visited. You, I don't even have to put the polygon on the map, but you can see, you know, this is a tiny remnant of forest in a totally deforested area. And this group of Malagasy botanists going out there and actually taking a bunch of observations, I think really complements the kind of data. And what we haven't done so much of in the past, but I'm really excited about to do moving forward is to try to bring this biodiversity data um, alongside land cover data, all this other data, so we can really start bringing the whole picture together. So we're just playing a small role, which is the biodiversity component, but I think it's, it's an important role, and it's exciting. I'm, I'm really excited this week to learn how we can complement it with these other aspects. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Scott. It's an easy one. You showed all these examples of um, terrestrial areas where people are doing observations. Do you have, um, a component of this where it's intertidal or near shore? Yeah, lots of, um, here in California, lots of intertidal activity, which is interesting. Whoa, um, there was actually a recent study um, that was done on nudibranchs, and have you guys heard of nudibranchs? So um, this year, because it was such crazy warm water, people were seeing nudibranchs much further north than they ever were, and that was all tide pool activity um, around, around um, the California coast. Um, also, there's a lot of divers. I'm just gonna randomly click here and hopefully I'll get something, whoops. Um, especially around places like Hawaii where there's a lot of diving. You see a lot of um, snorkelers and things like that. I'm not getting any, but trust me, there's a lot of uh, tropical fish and things, uh, things like that from the diving community who's using this. Of course, they're not using Android apps. They're using cameras, but then they're uploading it onto the web. How many of the species are identified by humans and how many are identified by maybe machine learning algorithms? And how do you weed out false positives? Yeah, so iNaturalist is completely a crowdsourcing solution to that species identification problem. Um, and it's all based on consensus. Um, so we have a lot of interesting algorithms that deal with this idea of how do you come up with strong consensus about what things are. We've been working a lot with machine learning people. One famous one is, I've, I don't know if you guys have heard of Leaf Snap out of the Smithsonian where you take a picture of a leaf and it uses machine learning. So they've been training their algorithms on our naturalist observations. Um, and again, we're more of a mission than a tool. Like if, if machine learning could do it, let's do that. But we, right now crowdsourcing is giving us the scale and the answers that we need. I was wondering if you could speak in a little bit more detail about your approach to quality control and quality assessment of the data that's submitted. Um, yes, yeah, sure. So, I mean, the, the interesting thing about biodiversity is that maybe we all agree it's a frog, and then um, there might be dispute over what family it's in or what genus or what um, species. So if I click on this, for example, this, uh, this is a picture, right? All of us agree it's a bird, right? Birds is a class called aves, aves, which is a class of organisms. Probably an ornithologist in the room would say that's, even if they were not familiar with the species, they would say that's a perching bird. And then they would say, I know that's a corvid, which is a type of bird like crows, jays, things like that. And then you get down into this actual um, species, which is Pica hudsonii. And so what we see here, I just randomly picked on this one, but um, this is someone posted this actually as magpies, the genus Pica, which is right, but it's less precise. And then she actually refined it herself, and then someone else chimed in, someone else chimed in. So we have three kind of strong consensus that is this. What you often get is that maybe the consensus is at the generic level. 
So there's a lot of things going like that, but it's all based on consensus. We don't have really expert review in iNaturalist, it's consensus review. How you define an observation? Um, is it animal presence, uh, or it can be, for example, a nest, a footprint, uh, sounds? Yeah, it's, it's evidence of a living thing at that time and place. So um, evidence is like a track or a scat or a nest is fine. Um, dead things are fine. We like captive things to be flagged as such so that we know that this is actually someone's pet dog or a zoo animal. And then, um, you know, if someone collected, if, some, if someone had, for example, a skull of an animal, we'd like the date and the observation of when that thing was collected, not where it's sitting in their, in their classroom. But, um, and that, that's the kind of data that's important for biogeography. Great, thanks so much, Scott. Guys.